And what we were saying is that God is everywhere present. Um, I want to continue to develop this. Not only is he everywhere present, but second, he is in the heights of heaven, which would include being everywhere present. But God dwells in the heights of heaven. Psalm 123, verse 1, to you I lift up my eyes, to you who are enthroned in the heavens. Now, the word heaven in Hebrew means heights. It's in the plural, which means where God's throne is, is way up there. That's why you have to lift up your eyes and say, you are enthroned in the heavens. Literally, it's the heights of heights. It's heights on steroid. It's heights exponentially. Psalm 97, verse 9, for you are the Lord most high, not just high, most high over all the earth. If there's an organizational chart for the universe, God is at the very top, way above everyone else. No one else on his level, towering over the earth. Isaiah 57, 15, which I've already quoted, God says, I dwell on a high and holy place. Revelation 4, verse 1, uh, a, a, a voice spoke to John and says, come up here. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne standing in heaven. Heaven is up. It's way up. It's the heights of heaven. That's where God is. Psalm 57, 5, be exalted above the heavens. Be above all the earth. Psalm 97, 9, for you are the Lord most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Psalm 113, verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high? Psalm 123, verse 1, to you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens, the heights Ecclesiastes 5.2, God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Isaiah 6 verse 1, I've already read it. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted. That's where God dwells. But God is not restricted to heaven. Not only is God transcendent, God is also marked by eminence. Not only is God high and lifted up, but He is also very near. He is ever close to us. Deuteronomy 4.39 the Lord, He is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Both heaven and earth, both transcendence and eminence. Joshua 2, verse 11, the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth below. Psalm 23, verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Isaiah 57, verse 15 is a remarkable verse. For thus says 
the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit. God dwells on a high and holy place and God also dwells with the lowly of heart. James 4 verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Listen to Jeremiah 23 verse 23. Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? It's a rhetorical question, the answer of which is, yes, God does fill the heights of heaven and God does fill the earth. That is why Jesus said, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. But not only is God high and lifted up, and not only is God near on the earth, God is also forth in the depths of hell, which is a shocking thought. God is in hell inflicting his wrath with the torment of the damned, punishing the ungodly. God has not delegated this to someone else. God has not subbed it out. Revelation 14, verse 10, he, referring to the one who worships the beast in the last days, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. What, a, what an imagery that is. The cup of God's anger filled with the wine of his wrath, undiluted, potent, strong. And he will be, referring to the one who worships the beast, he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The word in the presence of is a Greek word that means in the sight of or immediately before. Those in hell could only wish they were separated from God. They could only wish they were left to themselves. For God who is everywhere present will also be in the bowels of hell, directly inflicting His wrath upon unbelievers. Now, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 says these will, or at the return of Christ, referring to unbelievers, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. So these two verses would seem perhaps to be contradictory, how are they reconciled? This way, people in the lake of fire will be separated from the face-to-face -face intimate fellowship of God in Christ, but never from the heavy hand of His fierce vengeance. In hell, God's face will be turned away from the wicked, 
with no smile of his countenance. And they will ever be the object of his wrath. That is God's omnipresence. It's both comforting and it's both convicting. It's comforting to know that wherever I go, wherever I am, the Lord is with me with the fullness of his person. It's also convicting to know that wherever I go and whatever I do, God is with me. It's the appeal Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 6 to those involved in sexual immorality and sexual impurity who were joining themselves to a prostitute. And Paul says, what? You are now joining a prostitute to Christ. For your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, and you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. And for the believer to be involved in sexual immorality and impurity is to pull Christ into that defiled bed. And it's the motivation that Paul uses to awaken the Corinthians to their carnality and why they must sober up and be pure and clean before the Lord because God is with them in this act of sin. Let's consider the omniscience of God. We come to the second omni, the omniscience of God, which means that God is all-knowing. This is another staggering truth, an incomprehensible attribute of God. The Bible teaches that all knowledge is in God's mind already. He possesses infinite knowledge, past, present, future. God never learns anything. He certainly never learns anything from us. Nothing new ever enters God's mind. Nothing ever suddenly dawns on God. Nothing ever catches God off guard. God never has a eureka moment. God knows all things in advance. He knows what we will say before we even say it. God knows all things eternally, perfectly, Immediately, comprehensively. Let's talk about this. First of all, I want to give you eight truths about God's omniscience. One, God possesses self-knowledge, meaning God knows himself perfectly. God knows himself intimately. The Father knows the Son. The Son knows the Father. The Father and the Son know the Spirit. They know each other perfectly. 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, The thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. John 10 verse 15 Jesus said, the Father knows me, and I know the Father. Matthew eleven twenty seven. Jesus said, no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. There is perfect, intimate knowledge 
within the Godhead, within the persons of the Godhead. Second, not only is God's omniscience a self-knowledge, second, it is perfect knowledge. God knows not only everything within himself perfectly, but God knows everything outside of himself perfectly. God knows everything exactly as it is. God sees the reality of every person in every situation. There is no misperception with God. There is no misreading of a situation. There is no misreading of of an attitude in a person. Job 37, 16 says that God is perfect in knowledge. That is to say, God sees everything, God knows everything as it truly is. God never has half the story. He always knows the whole truth. Psalm 147, verse 5 says, His understanding is infinite, meaning there, there, there are no limitations to the knowledge of God. God knows everything that there is to know. There is nothing outside of the knowledge of God. Third, His knowledge is eternal. This perfect knowledge that God has He has possessed it from eternity past. God has never learned anything within time that he did not already know in eternity past. All that God knows, God has known from before the foundation of the world. If we have time to talk about it later, that is why... The word foreknowledge does not mean foresight. That God looks down the tunnel of time to see what people will do. Why would he do that? He already knows everything. He's never looked into the future and learned anything. There are no gaps in his understanding. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and following, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done. God knows everything that has not been done that will be done. Not only is God's knowledge perfect and eternal, it is immediate. All that God knows, He knows immediately. He knows simultaneously. He knows everything at once. You and I started in elementary school, primary school. We worked our way up. We acquired knowledge. We added to our knowledge. We read. We studied. We sat under lectures. We gained yet further knowledge. God has never acquired knowledge. God already knows everything there is to know. He never has to calculate something to discover the bottom line total. He never forgets and then remembers. He never adds to his knowledge. He does not know some things better than other things. 
He knows everything perfectly, eternally, simultaneously, immediately. Isaiah 40, verse 13 and 14. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as His counselor has informed Him? I think sometimes in our prayers, if we were to record our prayers and listen to our own prayers, we sound at times as though we are giving God updates on something that He does not know. And we are the informants of God. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as His counselor has informed Him? With whom did He consult? And who gave Him understanding? And who has taught Him in the path of justice? And who has taught Him knowledge? And who has informed Him in the way of understanding? The answer is no one. Paul quotes this in Romans eleven, thirty three to thirty five. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It's a it's a fathomless depth of riches of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments, how unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became His counselor? The answer is no one. Next, God's knowledge is not only immediate, it is exhaustive. (laughs) God knows everything down to the smallest detail. God knows not only the macro, God knows the micro. God knows not only the big picture, God knows every jot, every tittle, every molecule. A.W. Tozier has written, God knows all that can be known. God knows all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas, all feeling, all desires, every unuttered secret. Because God knows all things perfectly, He knows no thing better than any other thing, but all things equally well. He never discovers anything. He is never surprised. God is never amazed with a discovery. Psalm 33, verse 13, the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From His dwelling place, He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all. He who understands all their works. Psalm 33, 13 to 15. Psalm 147, verse 4. He counts the number of the stars. He gives names to them all. Proverbs 5, verse 21. For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord. And he watches all their paths. Proverbs 15, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. Not only is His knowledge exhaustive, it is penetrating, which is to say, not only does God see everything, and not only does God see into everything, God sees through everything. God sees what no man can see. God sees things that are done in the dark. He can see into the depths of the human heart. He knows what is truly there. 1 Samuel 16, 7, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4, 
Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. The word search means to explore, to, to spy out. It was used of, of Caleb and Joshua when they were sent as the two spies into the land, how they searched out the, the, the promised land and came back and gave the report. You have searched me. It means to dig deeply into, to to explore a country. You have searched me and and, and known me. You, You have dug into the depths of my being. There is no stone uncovered. There is no stone left uncovered. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. And that is a figure of speech which implies in everything in between. In the United States, we would say from the East Coast to the West Coast, referring to the whole of America. And we say from the East, from the East Coast to the West Coast, we imply in every state and every region in between. God sees, God knows everything from our sitting down to our rising up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path. The word scrutinize means to sift through something as, as to winnow it as, as grain. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted. Not just acquainted, but intimately acquainted with all my ways, even before there was a word on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all. Wow. That is exhaustive, penetrating knowledge. Psalm 139, verse 12, even the darkness is not dark to you. It means God can see in the dark what man cannot see. Even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Wow. And we think we would hide something from God? How this should affect even when we confess our sin. Just bring it out in the open. God sees it all. Jeremiah 17.10 I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. I, I, I can't know what's in your heart. You can't know what's in my heart. I can't see into your mind. I don't know what you're thinking. But God does. God reads us like an open book. Daniel 2, verse 20. He knows what is in the darkness. Hebrews 4, verse 13. There is... No creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. 1 John 3, verse 20. God knows all things. Next, God has all future knowledge. Not only penetrating knowledge, but future knowledge, which is to say God knows everything about the future before it happens. And the reason God knows everything about the future is God has already foreordained everything in the future. How about that?
Isaiah 42, verse 9, Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things before they spring forth. I proclaim them to you. It was in Isaiah the mark of the one true living God that distinguished him from the dumb idols that Israel was worshiping. Let the true God declare the future. The one true living God sees the future, knows the future, declares the future, reveals the future. A God who cannot foretell the future is a God who is not God. He is a dumb idol, emphasis upon dumb. He knows nothing. He has eyes, but he cannot see. He has ears, but he cannot hear. He's just carved out of stone, carved out of wood. But the one true living God sees the future, knows the future, reveals the future, declares the future. Isaiah 41, verse 21, "'Present your case,' the Lord says, "'bring forth your strong arguments.'" The king of Jacob says, let them bring forth and declare to us what what is going to take place. As for the former events, declare what they were. In other words, only God can tell us what's going to take place. Isaiah 44, verse 7, who is like me? God is the speaker. Who is like me? And what God will now say is what distinguishes God as God is the God who sees the future and reveals the future to men. Who is like me? Let him declare, let him proclaim and declare it. And the hymn refers to the dumb idols as though God is pointing to these dumb idols that Israel has succumbed to. You, you bow down before these God, small g, let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation. And let them, referring to all the pagan idols together, let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Prove yourself to be God. Isaiah 48, verses 3 and 5. I declared the former things long ago, and they went forth from my mouth, and I proclaimed them. Suddenly I acted, and they came to pass. Therefore I declared to you long ago, before they took place, I proclaimed them to you so that you would not say, my idol has done them, and my graven image and my molten image have commanded them. God has said, so that you will know that I am the one true living God, I have already told you the future, so that you will know these dumb idols know nothing, I alone know the future. God named Cyrus, who was king of Persia, 100 years before he appeared on the world stage. Would you like to give me the name of the prime minister of England 100 years from today? It's impossible. But God names even the pagan king who he he will be. The liberals can't even handle this. They have to invent excuses. This can't be prophecy. This must be a second Isaiah who wrote this after the fact. Because they are so filled with hardness of heart and unbelief that they cannot even believe in the one true living God who can declare the future. Every prophecy in the Bible that has been fulfilled is the validation of God that I am the one true living God. 
How else do you account for the prophecies in the Old Testament? Some 100 prophecies that have already been fulfilled in the first coming of Christ, to say nothing of the prophecies of the second coming of Christ. Normally, we think of prophecy dealing with the end of the age and the second coming. What about the prophecies that have already been fulfilled in the first coming of Christ? I mean, recorded in Scripture, centuries before Christ appears on the scene, God names the, the name of the city where the Messiah will be born. Micah 5, 2, out of you, O Bethlehem, shall come forth a ruler. Isaiah 7, verse 14, he will be born of a virgin. His name will be Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 11, verse 1 and 2, he will arise out of the lineage of Jesse and out of the the lineage of David. He will be a son of David. He will have a a ministry of, of, of teaching and performing miracles and speaking in parables. That he will be lifted up and crucified. Oh, his hands pierced before they even invented crucifixion as a means of capital punishment. The very words that he will say upon the cross. Most of these prophecies are fulfilled by the enemies of God and the enemies of Christ who have the least to gain by their fulfillment. All the way down to his, his burial, being buried in a, in a rich man's tomb... How can you work the fulfillment of this when you're dead? Except God has spoken the future and God has brought it to pass. It's the omniscience of God. His knowledge is perfect, eternal, immediate, exhaustive penetrating future. I want to add one more. It is the word possible, and by that I simply mean God even knows what would have happened if He had chosen a different course for your life. He took everything into consideration. He could have had you born in America. He could have had you born in China. He could have had you born three centuries before the coming of Christ. He could have had you born in the 21st century or in the 20th century. God took everything into account. His knowledge is exhaustive. He knows not not only everything that is real... He knows everything that is possible if he had chosen a different path. I mean, the levels of his knowledge are extraordinary. Listen to Matthew chapter 11, verse 21 and 23. Woe to you, Chorazin. Chorazin is where Christ preached the gospel. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre, where Christ had not preached, if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. That is an extraordinary statement. Then why didn't Christ go to those cities to preach? If they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes, why did he go to the city where they hardened their hearts and and would not believe? Because the sovereign, eternal decree of God marked out the path for the ministry of the Son of God that he would be an instrument not only of salvation, but also of further hardening of hearts. The same sun that melts 
the snow hardens the clay. R.C. Sproul writes, God knows not only all the realities, but also all the possibilities. That is the omniscience of God. Let's now consider the omnipotence of God. And I hope that our knowledge of God just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. There's a sense in which perhaps there's nothing that I've said today that you did not already know. But it is good for us to hear it again. And it is good for us to have it spelled out. And it is good for us to have it laid out in categories to give us structure for our thinking about God. The omnipotence of God. Not only is God omnipresent and not only is God omniscient, but God is omnipotent. Not only is God all-present and not only is God all-knowing, But now, God is all-powerful. God possesses all power. Just ponder that for a moment. Selah. Pause and meditate. He is the Almighty. If you are the Almighty, that means how much might do you have? All. Whatever might or power I have, which is like hardly anything, must have come from God to, get, to wake up in the morning, to walk the street, to walk into this room, to stand here on my feet, to look at my notes, to engage my mind to open my mouth, to speak the truth. It must be only by the power of God because I have no power except that from God. You have no power except what God has granted to you. And sometimes we are sick and God removes power. And sometimes God restores us to health and God gives back power. God is so all-powerful that nothing is impossible for God. Nothing within the will of God Nothing is hard for God. Even one of his Old Testament names is El Shaddai. El means God. Literally, it means the strong one. Shaddai means almighty. His name is the strong one almighty. He possesses all strength, and what power belongs to us is on loan from God. What power the devil has is on loan from God. A.W. Tozier again writes, Since God has at his command all the power in the universe, the Lord God omnipotent, can do anything as easily as anything else. All his acts are done without effort. He expends no energy that must be replenished. His self-sufficiency makes it unnecessary for him to look outside of himself for a renewal of strength. I mean, I have to keep 
drinking water. I have to keep drinking flavored water. I have to keep eating food. I have to sleep. I have to keep trying to put energy back into me. I have to expend energy to create energy. I have to walk. I have to work out. I have to exercise in order to have more energy back in me. But God is always almighty. He never loses any energy. He never needs to gain any power because every moment of every day, past, present, and future, He is the almighty. Tozier goes on to write, all the power required to do, all that he wills to do, lies in undiminished fullness in his own infinite being. Close quote. You'll never bring a prayer request to God that is too hard for him to fulfill. The only question is, is this the will of God? Now, five truths about God's omnipotence. Number one is infinite power, which means it is unlimited, it is boundless. God is able to do whatever God pleases. God possesses power to create everything in the universe out of nothing and he merely spoke it into existence. Let there be light. And there was light. By the breath of his mouth, he has brought forth everything. And God likewise effortlessly maintains and sustains the entire universe. Do you think he can uphold you? Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of His mouth, all their hosts. Jeremiah 32, verse 17, ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Matthew 19, 26, with people... This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Listen, there is no one too hard for God to save. He can save the chief of sinners. He can break open the hardest hearts. Not only is it infinite power, it is irresistible power. God's power is invincible. It is unconquerable. It cannot be overcome or turned back. No one can thwart the purposes of God when He chooses to act because His power is greater than all. If the entire world rose up as one force against God, God would but blink His eye and the entire force of the entire universe would be thwarted and turned back by one tiny little exercise of God's omnipotence. Job 9, verse 12, were God to snatch away, who could restrain him? Job 42, verse 2, Job said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Isaiah 14, verse 27. For the Lord of hosts has planned. Who can frustrate it? The answer is no one. Who could put up resistance to God? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? I mean, who can slap God's hand and, and, and turn it away? Are you stronger than God? Do you have more power as your ally? to marshal against God? Third, not only is God's omnipotence infinite and irresistible, it is inexhaustible. 
God's power is undiminished. He never loses power. His power is ever and always the same. God is not growing tired. God is not becoming weary with the passing of time. God is not over the hill. It is not as though God cannot do what He once did in the Old Testament. Psalm 102, verse 25, Of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure, and all of them will wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same. Everything is wearing out. Everything is wearing down. But God is the same. You and I are growing old. You and I are losing the power and strength of our youth. You and I cannot do what we once could do. But God is the same. Isaiah 40, verse 28, do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. He is the source of of all power and all strength. And when we, are, when we are weak, He makes us strong. And when we think we are strong, we are nothing. Not only is it inexhaustible power, it is incomprehensible power. God's power is so infinite and so vast and so great that it cannot be comprehended by man. Omnipotence is past our finding out. We cannot even grasp His power that has already been put on display, much less the far greater reservoir of His power. God is so powerful, He is able to do far more than what He even does. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to Him who is able, who is able to do far more abundantly, beyond... All that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Paul just stacks up superlative on top of superlative on top of superlative beyond this limit, beyond that limit, beyond this, beyond that. God is is able to do abundantly, far more abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think. It's beyond even our most out there thought about what God could do. according to the power that works within us. Fifth and finally, His power is not only inexhaustible and incomprehensible, it is self-consistent. And by that I mean God never exercises His power in a way that is inconsistent with His sovereign will and with His holy character. 
there are some things God cannot do. God cannot lie. God cannot sin. God cannot fail. God's power will never be used in a way that is inconsistent with himself and with his will. 2 Timothy 2 verse 13 says, He cannot deny himself. He is faithful to himself. He will never misuse his power. He will never abuse his power. There are earthly monarchs and earthly kings who abuse their power. It was said centuries ago that absolute power corrupts absolutely. To put all power in the hands of one king is too great a temptation without checks and balances and that he will misuse that power and dominate the people. But this king of kings and this Lord of lords will never abuse his power and will exercise his power only in a way that is perfectly in alignment with the rest of his attributes and his perfect will. We can trust God Have you ever heard someone say, well, don't ever pray that. God will do it. Don't ever say, well, I'll never go to the mission field. You know, God will, as if God is going to misuse his power in your life. Like you're smarter than God and, and, and now God has taken advantage of you and misused his power in your life. No, God cannot deny himself. And God cannot use his omnipotence contrary to his own purposes. Titus 1 verse 2 says, God cannot lie. A woman was teaching her elementary Sunday school class and said, is there anything God cannot do? A little girl raised her hand and said, yes. The teacher said, oh, nothing's impossible for God. The little girl said, God cannot lie. God cannot deny himself. There are things God cannot do because God will not violate his own holiness. It would be impossible Hebrews 6 verse 18 says, it is impossible for God to lie. You understand what the word impossible means? Not even a possibility. James 1 13, God cannot be tempted by evil. I see the clock. It's one o'clock. I need to stop. I'm not finished, but I need to stop. So, we must be those who have a high view of God. There was a great preacher in America named Donald Gray Barnhouse. I don't know if you recognize that name. He was a predecessor of James Montgomery Boyce, the 10th Presbyterian Church in downtown Philadelphia. I I will have the privilege to preach in that pulpit in October. I've preached there before. It is probably 
the one pulpit in America that has honored the truth for so long. It has remained orthodox and Bible-believing for 200 years. Donald Gray Barnhouse was a graduate of Princeton Seminary and one day was invited to come back to campus to preach in chapel. When you preach in chapel at seminary, it's a very intimidating experience because not only is the student body there, but the faculty is there. So you preach to your former professors. That's a very intimidating situation. Donald Gray Barnhouse stood in the pulpit at Miller Chapel, which is a spectacular, beautiful chapel there at Princeton Seminary, about two blocks from where, or three blocks from where Jonathan Edwards died. And he preached, and there on the front row was the faculty, and there was one professor, Robert Dick Wilson. He was fluent, it was said, in so many Semitic languages that no one knew how many languages he actually knew. In other words, no one was smart enough to know how smart he was. And in the middle of the message, as Barnhouse was preaching, Robert Dick Wilson stood up from the front pew and walked out. That's always somewhat of a disrupting (laughs) gesture or sign for any preacher, especially from the front pew, especially in the middle of the sermon, especially from one of the intellectual heavyweights of his generation. After it was over, Barnhouse could barely gather himself. And he worked up the courage to go down the hall to where Professor Robert Dick Wilson's office was, knocked on the door, asked if he could come in. He said, sit down. Why did you walk out of my sermon? Where did I fail? Tell me, where did I drop the ball? As you walked out. The professor said this, I always come back to hear my former students preach. And I hear them one time. And all I want to know is, are you a big God preacher? Are you a big Godder? Or do you preach a little God? He said to Barnhouse, you, sir, are a big God preacher. And I only needed to hear 10 minutes of your message to know that you have an awesome God and you hold forth the greatness of God in your preaching. That's the kind of preaching you need to sit under. And if you're not sitting under that kind of preaching, get out. And that's the kind of preacher you need to be. That's the kind of teacher you need to be. And that is the kind of witness for Christ you need to be. We're not holding forth a tiny little God. We are holding forth this omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. And he holds the whole world in his hands. Let me close in a word of prayer and we will pick up after lunch and we will have a QA and a a little bit and talk about what we've talked about. Let me pray. Father, restore to our hearts a sense of reverence, 
a sense of awe, a sense of astonishment, a sense of amazement. Cause our hearts to be bewildered again. Pull back the veil and allow us to behold something of your supreme majesty as we have looked into your word today. Enlarge our mind. Expand our hearts. Energize our souls for you. Make us big godders in this house today. That of which London is blind to. That of which London knows nothing of. May you truly give us eyes to see and ears to hear the glory of who you are. Lift us up, build us up, strengthen us, remind us that our lives are held in your hand. And that you are with us and for us as your people. We praise you for your grace that has been lavished upon us. In the person and work of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we treasure the cross. And may we not come before your throne of grace lightly but come with reverence and respect and awe that you have had mercy upon sinners such as we. We thank you for the food that we're about to have. We thank you for this time to be together. And we pray that truly the fear of the Lord will be the beginning of of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I think we have an hour, or I guess 50 minutes. I prayed too long. Um, 50 minutes, and I know that there's been preparation, so look forward to when we start back up. God bless you. Remember, we have John MacArthur queued up as well. He's uh, going to be a live stream, so everybody be on best behavior. <laughs> He'll want names from me, so uh, be on good behavior.